Alright, so I got this table flipped over. This rascal is heavy. It's a beast. These planks are 2x8. The bottom base is 4x4s. Four uh, it's a really popular look right now. I like the look of it. Um, rustic farmhouse table look. Um, the reason why my customer has wanted me to do anything to it, they just want me to put a clear epoxy over it. Um, when I told them that the epoxy wouldn't work on a 90 degree angle and I, I would have to do a round over, that's why I got my router here, I'm going to do a half inch round over, that's, that's going to take it down to the raw wood. And when that happens, really the best thing for me to do in order to match it would be to sand the whole table down and restain it rather than just try to match where I've rounded over. That would look ugly in my opinion. Um, they changed their mind, they wanted a more natural look instead of this dark stain. So. My plan was to take this table top off the base, sand the bottom, sand the top, resin the bottom, resin the top, then do a flood coat on the top. Uh, the reason why they want the resin is because between these planks, there's little gaps. And in those little gaps, food crumbs, Kool-Aid, sweet tea, you name it, they got three little kids. Uh, and they deal with anything that a family deals with. So, since I don't want to destroy the table taking it apart, I'm going to have to do it where it sits, where it, where it is now on the tabletop. That changes my plans. I'm not gonna be able to resin the, the bottom of it. Um, and that's really disappointing because I like to have the wood covered by the same material all the way around. If I stain the top, I'm also staining the bottom. I may not do as many coats, but I'm at least going to do one or two coats of stain on the bottom. If I'm going to resin the top, I'm going to resin the bottom. That way, the wood wants to move uniform. It's going to want to move. And while I'm talking about this movement, let's talk about breadboard ends. So I mentioned something in my first video, my introduction, that there's not a wrong way to do things. There's improved ways to do things. These breadboard ends are not put on more than an aesthetic function. So they're just for looks. Um, a true breadboard end is going to be here with a mechanical function. It's going to be mortise and tenon, some kind of loose joinery. And I say loose on purpose, not by mistake. It's got to be loose to allow the wood to move. So if you have it tight, it's going to fight each other, it's going to hold tight and it's going to end up splitting. But if you have it loose, it allows that wood to move. Uh, a table this size might move a quarter inch one side or the other, maybe a little less. And you might be thinking, hey man, a quarter inch, what's the big deal? A quarter inch is enough to split every plank. These breadboard ends are put together with pocket holes from underneath. They're screwed in at every plank. So these planks are going to want to move outward. The grain is like a moisture wick and it's going to wick in the moisture uh, from the humidity, from the seasonal changes, and it's going to want to move out this way. And when it does, those screws in this board are going to restrict that from happening. So one of a couple things is going to happen. Either you're going to get these boards that are going to cup or warp or you'll get a split or a crack either here or here somewhere something's got to give so that's also the reason why i think i can't get this tabletop off of it right now these screws are in such a bind from it wanting to move already that they're just stripping out when i try to unscrew them from the tabletop um, plus they're phillips head if they were star or square a lot more I could do and they're very recessed they're in like a two inch pocket hole I really can't get them out without destroying the table or at least doing enough damage to where I would have to repair it and make it look better and that's not what I was hired for I was hired to put epoxy on this table so I would love to talk to these this customer and convince them to let me build them a whole new table but they're on vacation while I'm doing this, and I really don't want to bother them. I'm going to do what they want me to do. When I picked it up, I told them what I saw that was wrong with the table, and they understood, but they didn't ask me to rebuild it.
So I'm going to do what I can to help them out. Hopefully it lasts several more years for them. The epoxy may help. Uh, epoxy is going to move too. It has some, some elastic qualities. Not a lot, but it won't splinter and crack at the first bit of movement. It can stretch a little bit. So that explains a little bit about some things that can be improved upon. I'll pick the camera up here in a minute and I'll show you that there's already been some movement, some, some warping and some cupping. And by doing these pocket screws instead of um, a regular glue, glue up with some kind of alignment help such as biscuits or dominoes or dowels, then you can feel these planks right here. They're not all even. Something just came up that I didn't plan on. I'm going to have to live with it. I'm going to have to make it look better by hand later on. When I'm doing the round over bit, when I got to the breadboard end, since they're not perfectly aligned with the tabletop, the base of my router, my reference point, was also not aligned. So a discerning eye can see the transition. So here we are. I think I'm finally ready to start doing the epoxy. That's what I was hired for this job in the first place. I'm hoping that the epoxy, one, will last, and two, will help the table last a little bit longer. This color, when I told the customer that I was going to have to round over the edges and that was going to ruin the finish, I told them, now would be your chance to change the color if you want to. And they sent me a picture of another table, and that table looked unfinished. It looked almost raw, just a little bit aged. And what this is, this comes from making a solution of distilled white vinegar and steel wool. The steel wool dissolves in the vinegar, and then you apply that solution on here, and it gives it an aged, gray, weathered look. Test boards. Here's one test board when the solution was just a few hours old. Uh, you can still see a lot of the original wood underneath it, and it didn't really give it an aged look, it just gave it a dry brush gray look, almost like paint. This is from the same solution time period on this table, but you see on this board it went almost pitch black. So you always want to use your test boards. I thought this was just a normal 2x4, just like these 2x8s, uh, but this I must have picked up some kind of fur somewhere. <coughs> Uh, more accurate test boards actually became my stir sticks. You can see the different layers from when I mixed it. So there's just one. Here's several. So each application, it got a little darker and a little darker and a little darker. And some of that is because the solution getting stronger. Some of that is just because of extra applications. So that's what we have on this table. And it gave it pretty good quality look. I like it. There is one issue that was difficult to correct and I'm still not 100% satisfied with it, but these three boards had a pinkish blush look to it naturally and this board and the breadboard ends did not. So I ended up doing the breadboard ends and this board with a couple extra applications that I didn't put on these, trying to darken them up. And uh, it helped, but I honestly, I wish I could have just rebuilt this whole table for them. Uh, it's really made me question whether or not I'll continue doing refinishing work in the future. I may or may not. I personally enjoy building it from scratch. And as the builder, you always know where you screw up and you know you're going to have to address that a step or two later in the process. And you're already thinking about it, formulating in your mind how you're going to do it while you're doing other things. With this, kind of get sidetracked, blindsided. I thought this was going to be a five-day job. It's ended up being two weeks. I'm not going to charge the customer more than what I 
originally quoted uh, because that was my fault. My quote was my fault. They've offered to pay me more and told me to charge them extra for what I think needs to be done. And my response was, my official fee remains the same. If you feel like the job is deserving of more money on top of that, then if so and how much, I'm going to leave up to you. So that's what I told them, and that's what we're going to do. At this point, I'm going to start mixing up the epoxy, putting the epoxy on here. I'm going to put a couple silicones on the top. Uh, those will take 12 hours to a day each, and then I'll do my flood coat, which is three times the amount of the seal coat, and then I'll brush the bottom. So we're looking at another four or five day process here just for the epoxy. I have gone underneath the table and I have put Tyvek tape everywhere that I can on these seams so that I don't lose my resin down the cracks and the holes. And uh, let's get started. All right, so we just did the first seal coat. One thing I've learned from my past projects and from watching, I think his name's Mike, on YouTube with Stone Coat Epoxies. If I got your name wrong, I'm sorry. Um, it's don't stress over this first seal coat. It's not going to look perfect. The more you try to make it look perfect, the more likely you are to mess something up. Um, some of these areas that look like bubbles are actually gonna be the opposite. They're gonna be dimples. And it's just gonna be thirsty areas in the wood where it just, soaked up that epoxy and just sucked it right in especially in the seams the cracks and the knots um, it'll look like dry areas um, after a while but at first it'll just be a slight dimple but when you're standing over it and the glare from the lighting it'll look like a bubble and if you try to torch it too much you're just going to scorch it and then you got more to work on later it's fixable but you make yourself more work don't stress over this first one. We're gonna be sanding, we're gonna be doing extra coats. Just about anything that shows up in this one can be fixed later with less work than if you mess it up more now trying to fix it now. So don't worry about it. Um, I'll babysit this over the next couple hours, come out every 30, 45 minutes, uh, pop any bubbles, and see how it goes. All right, so as of now, I've done all three seal coats. Put it on there. Spread it out with the squeegee. Don't try to make it look perfect. Be sure and rub the sides with your hand. That way you don't get little channels. And by channels, I mean, if you were to burn a candle, a pillar candle, and when that wax runs down the side, that wax that's standing up on the side, that is a channel. And this will channel if you don't make it to where it'll just flow over the side. And you do that just by wiping it down, either with your hand, gloved hand, or a brush. And you might need to do it a couple times. All right, so I'm ready for the flood coat. I have sanded it down, I've wiped it down, and a uh, little trick of the trade, any stubborn places that just keep on losing resin into it, little cracks, little knots, little pinholes, burn-in stick. Put the burn-in stick in a couple spots here, uh, here in the, by that knot hole, here by that knot hole. Uh, I tried clear. I didn't like the way it looked because it wasn't clear. It kind of came out of grayish white. So on top of the gray white color, I used a darker color and I'm happier with the outcome of that. So now I'm going to mix up my resin. This will be the flood coat. This will be three ounces per square foot. I won't use a squeegee. I'll use a one eighth inch notch trowel, spread it around, pop the bubbles, babysit a little bit, and be done with it. 